and welcome everyone. Today we're going to be talking about how to grow your own juniors, a guide to mentoring in an Elixir environment. I'm Max McClure. I use they, them pronouns. I come from a non-traditional background. I attended a boot camp after a career change and learned Ruby and JavaScript. I currently work at New Imperio as a junior developer and that was my first job as a developer and where I learned Elixir. I've been there for a little over a year. Hi everyone, oh mics. My name is Nikki Killinen and I use she, her pronouns. I come from a traditional CS background in contrast to Max having studied CS in college. However, New Aperio is also my first developer job and where I learned Elixir. So today we've organized our talk into three stages of growth and to support this, we came up with this imagery as a junior being a seedling planted into the soil that is your company. So as we go through our slides today, we have some reminders throughout to keep this image going. And we also want you all to think about and reflect on your team and see if maybe a junior is right for you. Just a little bit of context before we go into things. At New Aperio, we are a distributed, fully remote company, so a lot of the things we will discuss refer to how we do things in that sense. We also use the full pedal stack, so we will talk about different parts of that today as well. So the first stage in our three stages of growth is prepping the soil. The soil, it is your culture, it's your company and your team, and it's essential that you have some practices in place that will really help to bring in a new person. And so I'm going to start us off with some general workplace suggestions that we have implemented at New Aperio, and then Nikki will talk about some specifics prior to a junior's first day of work. So the first piece that's really important is knowledge sharing, and we do this a number of ways at New Aperio, and one of them is through video recordings. As Nikki said, we're remote, and so most of our communications that are synchronous are through Zoom, and that makes it pretty easy to record any sessions. In particular, we like to record whenever we're pair programming. This really helps for when a person who's experienced in the topic that they're working on can really help explain what they're diving into and then other people can go back and reference it to help their own learning. We also create asynchronous videos and these are short ones. We try to keep them five to 10 minutes to help explain complex topics. One time, Nikki made a really great video for me that explained the email flow system in the project that I was working in. And it was really helpful to more quickly onboard myself onto that flow and start implementing my own emails. A key part of these recordings is to upload them to a centralized location. We use Google Drive and have them organized into folders by project. And then we also try to follow a convention for naming to make it easy to find information. We usually use date, name, and then topics that were covered. It's also really important that you make your, your company a safe space to ask questions and to cultivate a culture of question asking. This is important when you bring on someone new who might, who might be uncertain and not confident about when and where to ask questions. So we use Slack and we have dedicated channels for asking different types of questions. Helping hands, this is where we will provide context for a problem that we are struggling with and then we can get asynchronous or synchronous help. Everyone uses this channel. We've had seniors post questions, juniors, and anyone can respond. And as a new junior, it was really helpful to see seniors utilizing it and gave me the confidence to ask my own questions and know that I wouldn't be mocked or anything like that. We use our programming channel for general questions about our tech stack and for sharing it, information about it. And everyone mistake, makes mistakes. This channel is really useful for posting mistakes that we make, because we all do, and we think it's important to learn from them. And in case you're wondering, our most common fix-up mistake amongst our team is merging our fix-up commits. So now that Max has gone through different items to prepare in your team, I want to step through some items to prepare for that first week of training. So your first item of business is 
who will be their primary point of contact, who will be their mentor, maybe they'll have more than one mentor. And part of establishing this is also establishing across the team that that mentor, they won't be quite as available, they won't be producing as much while they're training, and that that's just expected, and this will relieve that burden from the mentor and the mentee so they can really focus on training during the first week. Another thing to consider is how you will share these Elixir concepts with your new hire. We both walked through a slide deck presentation, and so we both thought it was quite useful to have. It's also nice to reference back later. And so this slide deck will have your fundamental concepts that is laying that groundwork of like what Elixir is and how it works. And we really stress including live coding examples among your slides. So pause sometimes, open up an IAX session and just run things for them right there as the mentor. You also could encourage your mentee, hopefully they have things set up by this time, and they can run IAX on their own and start running some of those examples you have on the slides. Lastly, I would like to focus on when you're building this slide deck, it's very easy to get carried away. Um, but if you can really focus on things that will help them directly with the production project that they will be joining later, it'll really get them prepared for that when they are onboarded later. The last thing to prepare for that first week is a sandbox project. So this is a just really fun space for them to practice and get their hands dirty without being worried that they're going to bring down production in the process. And we really want to stress that this is a fun project. It'll be something that your mentor and your mentee can bond over. So picking a fun topic that the mentee really likes, it'll just make it, it'll make it fun and engaging and it'll help them bond. For Mex, their sandbox project was D&D &D related and mine was rela related to Hades because I was playing it a bunch at the time. So it just made it fun and it's just a safe space to explore. Now when it comes to the technical requirements for this, the three needs we really would recommend is imitating a project structure that, especially that one that they'll join. So naming conventions, folders, the same version of Elixir and so on. And that'll just like, you know, remove any of those strange, weird roadblocks that they might deal with when transitioning later. Also introducing them to your team's testing practices right away in this project will really help them figure out what that process is. It might be totally unfamiliar to them. And lastly, if you can manage to at least mostly have your whole team's PR approval process set up, how do they write up that PR, how should they be naming things, so on, then they'll just really know how to do that for real when they're on that act active project. Things that are nice to have would be some mockups in a design tool. If you are going to have them do a lot of front end work, this could arguably be a necessity since they'll be doing that a lot. So for example, at New Apparel, we use Figma. So if you have some time to create some mockups that they can then implement, then that'll set that process flow in place. Another thing that's nice to have is if you set up your task tracking tool. So if you, let's say you use a JIRA board, or in our case, we use shortcuts. So you can set up a project there, populate it with stories so that they can see these are, you know, this is how it's organized. This is how I pick up my next task then that whole flow will start moving on this project and get them ready. So now that the soil is prepared, you are ready to plant your seedling. So the first week is really important. When you plant a seed, it needs a lot of water and attention. And similarly, your junior is going to need a lot of time. So we're going to lay out what that first week might look like and some important concepts to cover during that time. So here we have an overview of what that first week might look like, and we'll go into each of these in more detail. So that first day, your mentor and mentee will probably be spending about six hours together. The reason I don't say eight is because people need breaks, and the mentee in particular will probably want to take some time to reflect upon the information that they have been learning. It's important to get their dev environment set up, in particular make sure that they have all the languages and framework installed so that they can run an IEX session and any tooling and credentials they need to participate in the team. This first day will be a great time to do that slide presentation where you introduce the 
fundamental concepts that we'll, we'll be covering. And we recommend recording this so that they can go back and refer to it since what is on the slide presentation, we always elaborate more and talk about it in more detail. It's also important this first day to share resources, both internal and external. For example, if you recommend that they go check out Elixir School or if there are particular hex docs that you think that are important for them to read. And internally, where can they find these video recordings and ask questions? We like to collate these into a Google Doc so that for easy access. On your second day, this is probably going to be another long day, about six hours again, with that two-hour padding of just reflection and also some breathing space for your new hire. And during this pair, the six hours, this is when you're setting up that sandbox project. It's going to be pretty strange for them, but we think it's a really good time to have the junior drive while they're setting it up. And so as you're telling them all these commands to run and so on, once again, recording this will be really helpful for them to refer back to later. We only set up new projects so many times, so this can be a really good resource. And while you're running through setting things up, getting things started, making sure as a mentor to step back and give your mentee space to ask questions is really important. It's also a great time to just take a minute or two and just ask them like, oh, can you like reiterate what I just told you and just try to see where they are. It can be very easy to just keep going and keep telling them the next thing to do. So taking time to gauge their understanding and seeing where they're at can be a really great resource and learning opportunity. As for the rest of your first week, this is just going to be a lot of pairing on that sandbox project, probably more like four hours or so now, just so that those other four hours in the rest of the day can be spent the junior by themselves, working on tasks and figuring things out themselves. During that pairing though, this can be a fun time to alternate so the, the mentor can do some driving and so on. And like, it keeps it more stimulating. It's day three or four by this point, and there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, but also, like I said, those four hours of just independently figuring things out on their own is very important. So now we're going to go through different concepts for onboarding that we really recommend. We know that everyone here probably knows Elixir better than us, so we're not trying to teach you guys what, what is what, but we're, we wanted to share our reflections on areas that we struggled with, things that are kind of weird, and maybe some suggestions for if you are going to teach it to a new onboarding hire. So for our basic types, strings, booleans, integers, floats, these are pretty intuitive, and most people already have some experience with them. Atoms, however, are a little bit different story. For me, with my Ruby background, they're too, not too difficult to pick up since we have symbols, but Nikki had not seen anything like them before. So having them in the slide deck and then getting practice with them in the sandbox was really important to start understanding how they work and when they're used. For our collections, maps are pretty intuitive since most languages have a dictionary lookup type. Lists, for me, were a different story. When I first saw them, I just assumed they worked like an array. However, my mentor in the slide presentation explained that they're actually linked lists under the hood. And with my background, I didn't have a lot of data structure experience, so taking the time to explain how it's different from an array and what the different efficiencies are was really important so that I knew how to appropriately use them. Tuples for Nikki, she says, I've been told by her that Python has them, so she picked that up pretty quickly. For me, I hadn't seen anything like them before, so this took some practice, and it was definitely explained to me more than once before I kind of started getting the hang of them. Keyword lists, these are different and weird for different reasons. They have atoms, they have tuples, the syntax can change based on context. So this is different, definitely one of the ones we recommend having that IEX session open and showing some different examples of how it might look in different scenarios. So when we have our collections, we want to be able to manipulate them in various ways. For me, this was really my first for foray switching from an OOP mindset to functional programming. And in these two code snippets, they look very similar and like you should just be able to easily do, do one and switch your mindset to the other. This was actually a really big paradigm shift for me because 
before, I could just have my collection call the function right on it to change the, how it looks. Now I had to learn what even is a module, and you have to know really well what your data type is so that you know which module you need to find in order to find the function you need in order to change it. So when first teaching this, it can be really helpful to have the hex docs open so that you can point out exactly how to read this documentation. And we recommend using a few different data types and showing off a few different of the modules in that IEX session when you're presenting it in order to start exposing them to this. And with our collections, we often want to do more than one change with them. And so that brings us to the introduction of the mighty pipe operator. So for me, with my OOP background, my instinct was, well, if I need to filter and sort some data, I'll set a variable to the, to the filtered version, and then I'll pass that variable and sort it, which works, but it's not really how we want to think in functional programming. So I really learned through the, learned this with my, working with my mentor, who would validate that, yes, this is setting the variables works, but let's do this in the more elixir way, and let's try to refactor it with the pipe operator. I had to do this a few times and was reminded in code review as well. And now it's, I think, one of the most aesthetically pleasing things about working with Elixir. So when it comes to your control structures, these will be pretty straightforward for your new hire, likely, because we have our if and else's in other languages. Unless in cond were a little bit strange to me just because I'd never seen them before, but seeing that cond is basically just a chain of else ifs like I used to do was how I connected it back to pre what I learned previously. However, I think when you're working on control structures, I think something to keep in mind is how this can be a good chance to work more directly on that transition to more functional thinking. And one way to work on that is to think fewer conditionals, more functions. And we feel like one way that you could do that is showing guard clauses on your functions and how they're kind of your new condition. And that can help with that leaning more towards functions. And the motto just in general that we came up with as a result of thinking this way is just when in doubt, write a function. So reminding your mentee as you're working, like if they can think about a way to do it with a function, maybe try doing that. Obviously, it's not always the right choice, but it can be. And by like starting that thinking, you can get them to think more in a functional sense. Now, when it comes to pattern matching, this was like totally strange and odd to me. Um, I, now I love using it and probably use it maybe too much. I really enjoy it. Um, when sharing it with someone totally new to Elixir, though, I think starting with that match operator is the way to go. Being told that the equal sign was not the assignment operator that I'd been told my whole life was definitely a bit odd, but spending some time on it, some examples to see that, yes, in simple cases, it seems a lot like the assignment operator, but you can also do this really cool destructuring and also like illustrating like in an IAX session that you get match errors and so forth using it can really show your junior the power of pattern matching. And then the other like major power up of pat pattern matching is showing them how to pattern match in function heads. So this is also another way to reduce your conditional uses and use more functions. Now, like, we said, like I said before, we use the full pedal stack. So if it's the case that your junior is going to be joining a project with LiveView, two things to really keep in mind when you're onboarding them is that LiveView is really new, it's rapidly changing, we enjoy it a lot, but making your mentee aware that some of those tutorials you found might actually be stale will really help them not waste time. I know that the first component I was given, it was a modal component. I found this really cool blog post that would like step through things and I like spent a day or two reading through it, then found out that that LiveView version was like a lot older than ours and so I just wasted time reading that. And another thing also like related to all of that is when you're actually teaching about LiveView, if you can focus on just the version that they are going to use later, that'll help as well just to prepare them for directly what they need. And the last piece that we think is important to cover in your onboarding is testing practices. 
For me, I didn't have any prior experience with it, so even an introduction to what's the difference between a unit test versus an end-to-end -end test was really important. So covering some general testing principles and then also introducing your team's particular testing strategy is important. If you use TDD, what is that and how do you use it and making sure to implement that and practice it from the get-go in that sandbox project. So when you plant your seed, yes, you want to water it, but you don't want to overwater it and drown it. And in the same way, we want to be careful that we're not overloading our juniors with information. As a mentor, you just need to be aware that you will probably need to repeat yourself. And as a mentee, it is important to know that repeated exposure is important. If something feels redundant or like, oh, I've already said, like, re read this or heard this, it's important to get that repetition in in order to start building those functional programming muscles. And in this vein of thought, some topics that Nikki and I have discussed and determined that you really can delay teaching these are things like the pin operator. I learned about this later when I was doing code review for someone and I saw this funny looking carrot and I just asked, hey, what is this? And that was a really good opportunity for the person who had written that code to walk through it with me and I was able to read about it and then start using it later when the need came. Similarly, for the capture operator, I had written an anonymous function in my code and someone pointed out in my code review that, hey, you can use the ampersand. And my question was, okay, what is that? And then that led it to a really good conversation, more documentation reading, and then through that, I was able to start implementing that more frequently in my own code. And I have similar stories with using tail recursion and with. So the third and final stage is nurturing your seedling. So we've discussed how you can prepare the soil and get things started during that first week, but how do you continue that mentorship after the first week? So the first item of business will be bringing them onto an active project. And so things we really want to stress when you are bringing them on is how do you bring them on in a way that will help them build confidence and feel more secure in what they're doing. And so some things you can give them to help with that is some small bug fixes or maybe like a stateless component and just some smaller things that, you know, they can poke around and explore the file systems more. You can also give them something to recreate or modify. I know that a few months into my first active project, I was given some brand new CRUD pages to make and we had nothing like, we didn't have anything related to that data type yet in the app. However, we had other CRUD pages that were quite similar. So I was able to refer back to them, see how we were naming the files, where I should be putting stuff in the tests and so on. And that really helped me feel more secure in what I was doing and that I was putting up a more correct PR. So another really important way to learn, both as a mentee and all across the board in your team is through code review and establishing good code review practices. And one key thought is having a growth mindset. It's far too easy to think a comment is a criticism against you and your intelligence, but knowing that really it's just an opportunity to learn and grow as a developer is really important and it's crucial that senior members of the team model that for juniors. And it's okay to know that if you have to iterate on your PR more than once, that might happen and it's okay. Or you might have 130 comments on your PR and yes, that happened to me on one of my early ones, but because everybody was so helpful and had that growth mindset, I was able to not internalize that and instead view it as a learning opportunity. So what makes a code review helpful? One of the key things is linking documentation. If you suggest that someone use a different function, it's very likely it's because they didn't know that function existed. So having a link right to where that function lives in the docs can be really helpful for them to then go read more about that and then also get some more practice in finding information that they need. It's also important to be overly prescriptive. If you are new to this language and someone is a little bit vague in how you suggest they change something, it is very possible that they will go down a rabbit hole and make some incorrect assumptions, and then the longer that they spend time working on something that they 
that the suggestion really wasn't intended for, the more self-doubt will creep in. Some ways to help with being prescriptive is you can make an async video of your review to explain some of your comments more in depth. And my personal favorite is after you give that code review, you send them a message and say, hey, I had some changes that I recommend. Do you want to get together and talk about them? And then by having that synchronous communication, the, that gives the junior time to ask questions, and gives them that space, and then you can even work together on that refactor, which is a really good learning opportunity as well. Another key thing to note is that your mentorship will need to evolve with your junior. As they get better and as they grow, how you support them will have to change. An example of this is that Nikki and I, early on, we had weekly junior senior syncs. And this was a time where we met with the senior and we would ask a particular question in the code that we were working on to get help. This was because we both struggled with and were uncomfortable with using those async channels in order to ask questions. But as we both grew in our development skills and became more comfortable with our teammates and with using those channels, we were able to step away from that weekly sync and instead, when we needed help, we would have more ad hoc meetings. We do recommend, however, that you have, week, have regular one-on-one -on -one check ins And this is both for the mentor and the mentee to determine what is working in the mentorship and what might need to be adjusted in order to better improve the experience for both sides. And it's also a good opportunity to give feedback to the junior. What are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? And how can we continue to foster their growth? So to wrap things up, you can see by us having a whole talk today that juniors are an investment. They take time. You have items that you need to prepare. However, instead, I want to bring you back to that question where, you, where I planted in all of your brains about if it's right for your team. And I think a better framing of this thought is that juniors, yes, they're in a time investment, but they're an investment in that individual. You're teaching them a new tech stack that they probably will use for years to come, so it naturally will take time. It, they're also an investment in your team and your company. Your mentor is going to learn so much teaching, and that's invaluable for the team and the company. And finally, a junior is an investment in the Elixir community. We know that it's a pretty small community, and we are very grateful and thankful that New Aperio invested in us and welcomed us into this community, and we're so thankful to be part of it today. So thank you all for coming for, to our talk today. Thank <laughs> you.